Tonight, the class is on your mind and your memory. Here's our disclaimer. Same thing as it always says. Okay, we're going to first talk about the brain and understand a little bit about the brain. For years, people don't. Even a medical profession, they used to say, oh, if you have a brain injury, the brain doesn't heal. They found out that's not true. And what happened is sometimes there'd be people in a coma for 10 years, and then they would come out of the coma and be semi-comatose or whatever. And I think, I can't remember his name. is the guy who plays Superman. Reeves? Christopher Reeves. Reeves. There you go. Yeah. Um, he actually was um, an advocate for learning about the nervous system and the brain. And though his wasn't a brain injury, it was a spinal cord injury, he started getting some movement years after they said nothing would ever be able to happen. So we found out that the brain and the nervous system can heal. It just heals very slowly. Okay, let me get my thingy back here. Only 5% of our brain is our conscious part of the brain. That's what we can tap into. It is what we know all the time, like our RAM. It is like our C drive, where we can store information. 95% of our brain is subconscious. It carries, it picks up information. It does different functions that we can't control. Like, um, I can't say, all right, I want the chocolate bar that I have for lunch to go to my breast and not to my bo- to my butt. It doesn't work that way. Um, I can't say, okay, I want my heart, instead of my heart beating 70 beats a minute, I want it to beat 82 beats a minute. Most people can't do that. They say some yogis can do it or people who meditate, but typically it doesn't happen. But that 5% of our brain that we use consciously is amazing. It's still better than any computer there ever was. And although 5% of our brain controls our conscious mind, we only use a small portion of that. So the people that are savants that have these unbelievable abilities, we all are capable of doing that if we could tap into the full use of our brain. Other things, 70% of the total weight of the brain is water. What happens a lot of times is people do not drink enough water. They, um, and the older we get, the less water we typically drink. I hear clicking. Can you guys still hear me? Joanne, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Just making sure. I hear clicking every once in a while. Yeah, other people say they can hear you too. I'm not hearing it, so it must be on your end. Probably. Probably is. Okay. And um, so drinking a lot of water is important. If you stop drinking water, you can get shrinkage of the brain. You know, if you have a a sponge is all dried out. It's smaller than a sponge that's been soaked with water. It weighs less. It hardens, and it is less volume. Same with our drinking water. Sometimes people get headaches or get dizzy, and it's because they're dehydrated. As we get older, people tend to drink less and less water, so we train our body to work with less and less. That doesn't mean that it's not optimum, optimal to have that amount of water. It's just that our body's been able to adjust a little bit. So the rule of thumb is one half of our weight in ounces of water. So if you weigh 150, 75 ounces. If you weigh 5,000 pounds, well, you don't go over 100 ounces. That's the max. So if you weigh 300, 400, 500 pounds, you still only do 100 ounces of water. Then, after you suck all the water out of the brain, 
60 to 70 percent, and I've heard up to 75 percent, is of the brain is made of fat and cholesterol. As we get older, many times people will go low fat, no fat, I'm afraid of death of fat diets. And the brain and the body needs that to heal. So making sure that you get good fats. I'm glad to see that the keto diet is starting to become popular. Um, you got to watch how you do it, of course. All diets, you can go too radical one way and cause an imbalance. But the idea that we need fats, I'm glad it's being emphasized. It is in other countries. It is always downplayed or they throw a caution to the wind, these doctors, about taking fats. But we need these fats. The average person has 70 thoughts a day. Um, I mean, 70,000 thoughts a day. I'm not sure how they can figure that out, but I trust it. Listening to music strengthens the brain. So much so that it actually can help the brain reheal. There's one of my favorite movies. is a movie called The Music Never Died. Did anybody watch that movie? I don't know, Joanne, did we have a link to that movie free online? I am not sure. I will look. Okay. I think we do, if I'm not mistaken. I think you found it for us one time. But it's about this, this kid that his father and him got angry, and he, the kid left to work in a band, and he burned his brain out with drugs. And... um they find him, and they find his name, and they contact with the father. And the kid was basically burned out. He was semi-comatose. And um, if they talked to him, he he wouldn't re- – he's almost catatonic. He wouldn't talk to them. He wouldn't react to whatever they said. Then somebody played some music that he recognized, and he perked up. So his father started doing all kinds of experiments with music and talked to a lady who used music to help people heal their brain and their emotions and stuff like that. And it changed this that he, while they played the music, his son could communicate. And I'm not going to tell you the rest of it because I don't want to ruin it for you. But it is definitely an amazing story. And it's based on a true life experience. So this really happened. I'm sure they tweaked it a little bit, but the basis of it is true. Most of the time, people listen to music up until they're about 25 years old. And after that, people start listening to less and less music. I know I don't listen to music the way I used to when I was young. I had music on all the time. And I forget to turn music on sometimes. I try to, I do Pandora when I do my emails and stuff like that. But music touches so many different parts of the brain. Playing music is even better, especially an instrument that you hold against your chest, like a guitar. You play a guitar, the vibration actually touches the vibration of the body, and there's um, all kinds of benefits from that. And this is something that the medical profession doesn't really talk about much, although they cannot deny it. Thoughts are things, and they can affect our physical self. An example of this is somebody will say, oh, man, he was so scared he peed his pants. Well, fear settles in the kidneys. Or he died of a broken heart. The feeling of being rejected or um, losing a love of some sort or being betrayed settles in the heart. And if that's ever happened to you, you actually feel a pain there where the heart's located. So thoughts are things, and they can affect us. There's two things we usually use interchangeably. 
the word brain and mind, but they're not. They're not at all. The brain is like the light bulb. The mind is like the light bulb that is lit. You can have 50 light bulbs laying around the house, but they're not connected to electricity and they're not turned on. They don't illuminate anything. So when people have brain damage, it's not so much that the brain has disappeared. It's just it doesn't connect to anything anymore. It's no longer lit. This can happen for someone who's comatose, but this can happen in little wee sections too. I was in a car accident in 1984. I had a concussion for over six months. Now my sense of direction is not what it used to be. I could go somewhere one time and I'd know how to get there. Now if I didn't have GPS, I could get lost from my bathroom to my bedroom. So that part of my brain is not what it used to be. I'm not seen now yet. Definitely not comatose because I run my mouth all the time. But part of my brain does not work as well as it once did. And this happens through different things that happen. A physical injury like my car accident. It can happen because of poor nutrition, like especially fats, zinc, and magnesium, and we'll get into a little bit of that later on. Poor circulation, if the brain doesn't get the amount of oxygen and nutrients and blood that it needs, it starts to die and to shrink. Parasites, toxins, chemicals, EMS, and emotional injury. An emotional injury, I do iridology for those who are new here. Emotional men injury shows up in the brain area. And we're going to be teaching that class in a couple months. You might want to step in on it. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, so let's take these. Oh, wait a minute. I was getting ahead of myself. This is something else I found um, that people told me after my last time I taught this class. That they are showing that dance really helps keep your cognitive therapy. I mean, your cognitive ability. I don't dance much, but the fact of using, you're hearing something and you're moving the left and right side of your body really connects your brain together and it actually strengthens your mental ability. And these are some studies. Anytime you see green stuff on the side, links, those are studies. If you want to learn more about this, Email me, and I will send you these links. Okay. Your brain takes up a typically about 2% of your body, if your average weight, or about 3 pounds. But it consumes at least 25% of your total oxygen and 20% of your sugar. So you can tell how important the brain is. Metal deposits, especially mercury, aluminum, copper, do not work well because our brain is electrical. There's actually electrical impulses that they can measure on a machine that goes through our brain. You know, if you have a battery and you put a piece of metal across both poles of that electrical battery, that it will short out. And so does our brain. There's a connection with aluminum, especially with Alzheimer's. And I was in the class where the teachers taught us how this started. Over in England somewhere, there were um, people that were raising turkeys. And all of a sudden, these turkeys were going out in the middle of the night and stare at the stars. It was just they just kind of look around and get all doofy. And they knew there's something wrong with their brain. And they killed these turkeys, and they found out that there was aluminum in the brains of these turkeys. 
and they followed the thing and they found out that what happened is there was some place that would bag um, insulation and they bagged the food for the turkeys. Somehow, and I didn't think there was aluminum in insulation, but somehow the aluminum got in with the turkey feed. So the turkeys with the food was eating these little wee shavings of aluminum. And they found out that turkeys that didn't have stargazer disease, going which is like the human the turkey form of human Alzheimer's, didn't if they had aluminum, they had the stargazing disease. If they didn't have aluminum, they didn't have the stargazer disease. And that's what started that whole connection. That's fascinating enough, but this is something that I really took from the, the lecture that I went to. There was one guy that got his feed from everywhere else, where everyone else got their feed. And his turkeys didn't get stargazer disease. When they did an autopsy on his turkeys, they had no aluminum in their brain, although they had been eaten food that had aluminum in it. And they couldn't figure out why they did, like scientists do, the pressure, the height, you know, the altitude and all this other stuff. And the one guy says, I wonder if it's because I give my turkeys vitamin E with selenium because I sell them to this one restaurant and they like the turkey's meat being really, really um, moist and juicy. And vitamin E with selenium will keep the turkeys ju ju juicier for lack of a better word. And they tested and they found sure enough that's what it did. When they would take some turkeys and give them vitamin E with selenium, the turkeys would not absorb any of the aluminum. So it makes sense to me that if you have the kind of body that does absorb aluminum, which can be seen in iridology, by the way, or if it's in the family, because it tends to there's certain bodies that tend to absorb aluminum easier than others. I would take vitamin E with selenium. It's not going to hurt you. And it might prevent Alzheimer's from happening. You can absorb copper, which is what um, Wilson's disease is, or mercury. And mercury, they know, you know, this is what a lot of people think might be causing the autism in children. And I don't want... I'm not going to get into that debate whether it does or doesn't. But mercury is a metal. So, again, if you put a metal of any kind into an electrical system, you know that mm, that's not such a good idea. Okay, you need – and remember, if you're new here – I don't know if we even have any new people here. But if you're new here, we – you can ask questions along the way. And Joanne will read them to, to me. Do you have any questions yet, Joanne? Yes, there's a question. So family tendency would indicate Alzheimer's in the family? It can, yeah. There's some people that seem to absorb aluminum more than other people. So the tendency can be in a family. But again, it's like anything that's genetic. You need to turn on the gene. If you have the gene to get Alzheimer's and you've never been exposed to aluminum, you will probably not get aluminum-caused Alzheimer's because there's more than one cause of Alzheimer's. That's just one of them. So you, there's, you can always, when you find something that's genetic, there's things you can do to prevent it from turning on. But there's tendencies in the family. Okay, so other things we need to do, make sure we have enough dietary fats, good fats like butter, olive oil, coconut oil, borage oil, hemp oil, things like that. A good amount of water. And magnesium is important. The number one mineral that people are deficient in in the United States is magnesium. Most people are so 
low in magnesium that they cannot build it up just through food. They almost have to take the isolated magnesium. And then after you get it up to where you need to get it, or where it needs to be, then you usually can just do it through diet. Symptoms of lacking magnesium are kind of weird. One is you crave chocolate or coffee. Now, coffee can also be addicted because of the caffeine. But if it's like, oh, I just love the smell of coffee. I had a friend that loved the smell of coffee, although she never drank coffee. Or if someone would say, well, we have lemon meringue pie, we have um, cherry vanilla ice cream, and we have a small piece of chocolate. If it's like, i got to have that chocolate, not just sweets, because that's a different um, if you crave sweets, that's a different thing, chromium usually. But if it's chocolate specifically, then that's a magnesium deficiency. If your heart ever feels like it beats weird, or if it ever feels like it flutters around in there, that is a severe magnesium deficiency. Another thing that happens is if your butt ever gets cold. Whenever you're, if you're sitting in a room, and you're all covered up, your stomach should be warm, and when you put your hand around and you feel your butt and your upper legs, they should be warm too. If the butt is a little bit cooler, then that's a profound magnesium deficiency. Memory is affected by magnesium. You should have two to three bowel movements every day, and it should be very easy. You should sit. And I don't know if you ever saw a cow go to the bathroom. They just kind of go splat. That's how we should go. You shouldn't have to push. If you have enough magnesium, there's enough magnesium in the muscle of the intestines for the peristaltic action. So if you're having any of those symptoms, I would add magnesium. And then, of course, you need to sleep enough and try to avoid stress, which is a lot harder than you would think. This is an article that somebody put on Facebook, and I read about it, and how this woman had dementia, and her son, this is her son, um, totally changed her diet, and she ended up not being having dementia anymore. So it can happen. Anyone who has studied the brain has probably heard of a gentleman oops, named Dr. Amen. He has his own clinics, and here's a link to that. I was privileged to see him. I actually shook his hand, but I was privileged to see him in a lecture, and it was fascinating. Not only is he brilliant, he's very entertaining. And these are things that I learned from, or that I learned from his lecture and I haven't heard anywhere else. What is good for your heart is good for your brain. So if you're having any kind of heart problems at all, that indicates that your brain is probably not working 100%. He's also a strong advocator, and he had pictures of thermograms of um, brains before and after he worked on them nutritionally. And he said that the brain does make new brain cells, but they will only live four weeks and they die unless you use them. There's another thing. There was um, a bunch of nuns in some place. I'm not really sure where it was at. But these nuns, they studied them because they would be in their 90s to early 100s, and they would still work every day in this library. And every one of them was sharp as a tack. And they came to the conclusion that it was because they used their brains. They never stopped 
and retired that they didn't use their brains at all. They kept them alert and kept at bay any kind of dementia. So if you use your brain cells, they don't die off like they do if you don't. Use it or lose it is especially true for the brain. We can poison things, poison the brain. Alcohol, terrible. Caffeine is horrible. Smelling paint, you know how these young kids are huffing and stuff like that? If they only knew what they're doing to their brain cells. Tylenol. Not only is Tylenol the number one poison for the liver, it also is bad for the brain. Medications, especially statin drugs and pain medications are very hard on the brain. Then there's things like NutraSweet, which they're starting to call amino sweet. They used to call aspartame, a very name, and MSG, monosodium glutamate. These contain excitotoxins. Excitotoxins cause the neurons to fire so quickly that they burn themselves out. I had a friend who lived in a small town called Revlock, Pennsylvania. And her neighbor went into a coma and died. There's, of course, an autopsy, and it was written down as um, natural causes, even though I think she's like 60 or something. She was relatively young. And she died of nat what they said was natural causes. A couple weeks later, these two people from the FDA came and interviewed her husband and said, did your wife use a lot of MSG or NutraSweet? And the guy says, yeah, she drank Diet Coke all the time. Why? And they said, well, we find found an abnormal amount of alphenylaniline, which is an amino acid that's in NutraSweet, and we found some MSG. But what happened is her brain calcified. That's why she went into a coma and died. And they led led him or led him to the conclusion that that is why she died. It was from the NutraSweet and the MSG. Okay. Um there are some things that are really, really good for the brain. Ginkgo because it's a vasodilator, it helps open up the blood vessels so more oxygen and nutrients get to the brain. Also, more toxins can be taken from the brain. Sage, not only does sage help you keep your hair color, uh, which I don't use, of course, but sage is also supposed to be very good for the brain. Huperzine is um, an isolated nutrient I can't remember. It's in an herb, and I can't remember the name of the herb, but the herb is in Brain Protects. But Hooperzine um, is like the thing after fatty acids and water to nourish the brain. Omega-3 oils, make sure that you get good omega-3 oils because the fish oil that's out there is garbage because our water, so much of our water is garbage. And whenever they extract the oils, they get some of the, the toxins, the radiation, or the heavy metals and stuff like that. Um, I like Nature Sunshine's Omega Oil, Super Omega 3 Oil. They have exclusive rights to a place where they can get their fish that no one else can do. And they have a distilling process that's patented that removes all the impurities down to what Lauren Smith said, only 10 parts per billion of the oil is impure. That's phenomenal. Other things that are really good are walnuts and pecans. Macadamia nuts are pretty good too. And gotta cola. Gotta cola is something that they um, attribute to elephants always remembering. 
I don't know if that's true or not, but Gata Cola is very good for the brain. Dr. Amen also stressed how sleep is important, exercise is important, music therapy is important in letting the body, letting the brain repair. And sometimes when people say, oh man, I'm just too tired to think, sometimes it's because you're dehydrated. Okay. So are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so if what's good for the heart is good for the brain, is what's not good for the heart also not good for the brain? That's what Dr. Amen said, yes. Yep. And Cherie made a comment, Huprazine is extracted from oops, Chinese club moss plant. It's a cess, I'm sorry, I can't say this, cess, Quoterpene alkaloid compound. Okay. Thank you, Sheree. The, do they have um, brain protects in Australia, Sheree? <clears throat> no, they don't. Uh, well, Dr. Amen, the reason... The only reason why he agreed to come and talk to us is because he was so impressed with Nature Sunshine and having Hooperzine in their brain protects. That's a shame. They should. These guys should fight for it. Okay, so the things that we listed before, we're taking them one by one, not necessarily in the right order, but... Um, Give and take your such All righty, so I would avoid toxins, especially the heavy metals. Heavy metals are found in our fish source. I don't even eat fish, local fish. And I used to love catfish. And a couple times they will announce, you know, you shouldn't have fish more than so many times a week. They're caught in Pennsylvania waters because there's so much mercury in our water. Well, if it can kill you, if you take too much, I'm not going to do any at all. People have known about lead for years, and lead's not as much of a problem unless you have an old house because they've pretty much cleaned a lot of things up with lead. Like, you can't buy lead-based paint anymore. But these things are also found in seaweeds. So people are taking, um, like, spirulina or bladder whack or Irish moss or kelp and they're eating them. I know you can get kelp chips, which doesn't sound like a good idea to me. But you can buy them and they're in a health food store and they say they're healthy. But these things are known to pull to pull mercury and these heavy metals into itself. If you're going to do something like that, make sure that you write to them, find out if they have tested for all these heavy metals. Um, what is it? Klamath Lake is tested. So that one, at least, unless they've changed things, if it comes from Klamath Lake, they're usually pretty good. And we said about this, this, and this. Smoking. Smoking restricts the um, capillaries. Also, you know, if you breathe pure oxygen in, of course you're going to have more oxygen in the brain as if you put suck in some smoke with it. So smoking is not a good idea. Another thing is grains. Here's a book written by a guy that's called The Grain Brain. I think he also has wheat belly. He, David Perlmutter wrote a book on, um, yeah, I think it's called Wheat Belly. But Grain Brain, and I know this myself, I'm not as articulate right now as I can be because 
Christmas time is a time that if you would see me when I eat at Christmas time, you would think I know nothing about natural health because that is my time to totally destroy my body. I do like all year long I do good and then Christmas time I blow it. I notice that whenever I eat breads or, or cookies or anything with wheat, it affects my ability to think and um, to speak more clearly. We went over the vitamin E with selenium. If you think you've been exposed to heavy metals, there is something called heavy metal detox. There's also a chelation. You can either get intravenous chelation, and if they find lead in your body, a lot of times you can get your insurance company to cover the intravenous chelation. And then there's an oral chelation as well. But I usually like people to start out with heavy metals because this is going to pull metal out of the body and dump it in the intestines. If you don't have three good bowel movements a day or if your liver is not really, really good at filtering everything out, you could reabsorb the metals. And I think that that would just be working against yourself. Hey, Joanne, I see a bunch of flashes. I can't read what they said. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, the first question is, um, you said uh, things that pull the, the toxins, kelp, seaweed, spirulina, what else? Um, Irish moss. Corella, bladder whack, those um, are the ones I would really check for metal. Okay. And do you know what the effects of the vape smoking are? Yeah. Well, we don't know whether all they are, but there's a lot of children that are getting damaged doing it. Sucking anything in your body, in your into your lungs, gets into your bloodstream. So it only makes sense that, I don't know who came up with the vaping idea. It's kind of stupid. You know, it's like saying, here, don't you hit yourself in the head with a hammer. Use a hatchet. You know, you're still hurting your body. I don't know why they came up with that. So breathing anything in like that, anything that's artificial. Now, the only thing that would be different would be essential oils. And you even have to watch your essential oils. I would get a good brand. If you do not get a good brand, you could be absorbing unnatural chemicals in your body. But vaping is not made from chamomile. You know, it's made from chemicals. And I would not do vaping either. Good questions. Any other questions? What? Do you suggest instead of spirulina? Oh, I'm not saying you can never use spirulina, but right, make sure it comes from a Klamath Lake. Oh, blue green blue green algae is another thing you have to watch where it comes from. But I would make sure that it comes from a really good company. So if you take spirulina, write to the company say, "Have you tested for radiation and heavy metal?" And even if they say, "Oh, we don't have to worry about radiation," it was done in Idaho. It was got from Idaho. Well, Joanne and I have a friend named Victoria Terry that got really sick and she went to the doctors and they tested her and they said, you have radiation poisoning. Not really bad that she didn't die, but she had radiation in her body and that's what was causing her thyroid to go crazy and the ill health that she had. And they tested it and they said, the isotopes of the radiation that you've been exposed to came from Fukushima. So somehow through wind and rain and who knows what else, because you never visited Japan, whenever they had that accident, it settled in the Idaho Valley. And the doctor says, we've seen quite a few of these instances. So you have to make sure that the company tests. A good company will say, yes, we test it. 
we have a certificate showing that it is free of I don't know whatever metals and, and radiation or whatever they, they test for. So it's not that you should never take any of those things that I had mentioned. Just make sure that you take only the best company that has tested for heavy metals and radiation. Okay? I'm glad you, you asked that because I didn't mean to leave the impression that you should never have spirulina. Any other questions? That's it for now. Okay. Then there's other things, and we're going to go through these kind of fast. Ammonia. This actually happened to my mother. My mother was a sharp lady. She put the oxygen system in the very first jet ever made, the prototype. She was just a brilliant lady. And one day, my stepfather called me. He says, come over. Mom took a stroke. And my mom's in, there, in her chair, and she's picking things out of the air, and she's folding her shirt, like pleating her shirt. And I was talking to her, and she looked at me, but she wasn't talking, and like whatever I said didn't seem to register. We took her to the hospital, and the doctor came over, and he says, she turned. She went see now. You know, there's nothing we can do about. It. We suggest you you go to a nursing home. There's hate of manor down here. I said, wait, 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 wait. You don't go see now in one day. You're full of crap. And they said, well, she didn't take a stroke. She didn't have an an. She doesn't have an aneurysm. There's nothing biological. And I remember taking a class on clinical trials, and the lady has said about one clinical trial that they did that some of the people that were putting in nursing homes for dementia actually had ammonia in their brain, that they had a low-grade bladder infection, which allowed some of the ammonia to get into the brain. So I asked them, I said, test her for a bladder infection. They said, was she complaining of it? And I said, nope, not at all. He says, well, I, don't, I said, I'm telling you, test her. They came back, and he says, she has a raging bladder infection. They gave my mom the antibiotics, the ammonia cleaned out of her brain, and the next day she was sharp as a tack again. So I think the study that they showed that some people that have dementia do so because they have ammonia built up in their brain, that should have been released front page of news. How many people are destined to live the rest of their life in a nursing home when an antibiotic would get them out of it? That just went out. All right, so make sure you keep your pH normal. We have a class on pH. If you haven't been able to see it, let us know, and we can tell you where you can find it on YouTube. Lack of oxygen, not just from smoking, but sometimes you might have emphysema or COPD. Poor circulation, either because your heart is weak or some people get plaque built up in your carotid artery that goes to the brain. There's type 3 diabetes. Type 1 and type 2, most people know about. Type 3 is really, it's just kind of like a play. But basically they found out that if a lot of sugar goes to the brain, that um, it can cause dementia or all, actually even Alzheimer's. You'd be surprised, but some people have parasites in their brain. Typically, they're not like big tapeworms or something like that, although I guess that's not impossible to happen. Usually, they're small, like um, like in Lyme disease or um, microscopic parasites. Yeast in the brain can cause a lot of havoc. We already talked about wheat. Um, okay, the rest we kind of talked about. All right. If somebody has had parasites or yeast or ammonia in the brain, there is an herb, well, actually an amino acid called L-glutamine. It's an essential amino acid. Um, if your liver is working at optimum level and you have a good diet, 
your blight usually can make its own, but if you don't have either one of those, um, you might want to add some L-glutamine to pull that out. It also supplies the brain with energy. It encourages new cell growth of the brain, and it pulls out ammonia and different toxins. Okay, um, Joanne, did you happen to post the thing about pH? I did. I figured so. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so basically your saliva and your urine should be within these boundaries. If it is, all the other fluids will be as well. If you're too acidic or too alkaline, it will irritate the arteries. Just like when I play my guitar, the tips of my fingers will get sore, and what starts happening is the body will start developing a callus to protect the skin. That is what cholesterol buildup and plaque buildup is. It is a body's way of protecting the wall of your arteries, either because there's sh um, sharp sugar shards in it or uric acid or just the pH alone. That's why if you want to see if you're going to have buildup in your arteries, the best thing to do is to get um, a C-reactive protein test or a homocysteine test. They'll tell you more than just taking blood and see what your cholesterol level is. We have a class on fats, oils, and statin drugs. Um, what is in the media is not factual. If you go in Google and type in cholesterol myths, you will find millions of articles that prove that what we're taught about cholesterol is not true. If you have buildup in your carotid arteries, chelation, either oral or, interve or intravenous, can usually clean that out. Things that cause acid, emotions are number one. You can go from being normal to being extremely acidic in a couple of hours if emotions are involved. Some people are really good at marriage. I suck at marriage. I just, it's not my thing. I've tried it a couple of times. Not my thing. And my second marriage was quite bad. And I went to the eye doctor and I said, my glasses are all messed up. And he said, well, did you pour acid on it? Because they were etched from the acid. And I said, no, and I took my pH and it was like, it didn't even register. So it was below 5.0. Some pain medications or other medications too can cause acid. Soda, coffee, and this isn't diet coffee it's just your diet I guess I should put that especially coffee, tea, caffeine milk products, milk, cheese, ice cream and yogurt butter's okay because it's made from the fat and the butyric acid leaves an alkalizing ash but the other milk products are very acidic sugar is very acidic which is, the, this is the hardest for me to, I am such a sugarholic. Anytime I don't eat sugar is because I fight it. And I do most of the time, but I give in once in a while. Poor digestion, if you burp or you blow it or pass gas, that means you're not digesting properly. Which also could mean that um, you're producing acid. Processed foods, cooked foods, even if you juice something, if you're going to do something, drink it right after. If you wait a couple hours, 
the enzymes die and it turns from acidic to an al I mean from an alkalizing ash to an acidic ash. And then grains. Not the old fashioned grains, but the new things nowadays. Okay, let me do this here. See what link this is. I don't remember which one it is. Oh, unavailable. No? Guess we can update that one. Okay. Keep your respiratory system healthy. Stay away from black mold, chemicals, paint thinners, coal dust, lint, talcum powder, flour, and smoking. If you have emphysema or COPD, I would suggest you do lung Chinese lung support and do castor oil packs on the lung. All right. Now we're going to talk about yeast. There are three studies of the eye, at least three studies. Actually, there's five studies. Time risk and um, ray it. I don't do those two very much. But there's pupil tonus, iridology, and sclerology. All these indicate different things. These little places right here where there's dots at the end indicate yeast. This area is your brain. So this person has yeast in their brain. They have yeast other places too. But they have yeast in their brain. And this, what is haze, it's called lipemic diathesis. That indicates a possible buildup in the carotid artery going up to the brain. And the fact that this is all fuzzy up here, see how this is crisp? It's like iris and then white. But this, it just kind of fades. This indicates brain shrinkage. So this person, they come to me and say, I'm having a hard time remembering things. Well, no wonder. Their brain is shrinking. They're not getting the oxygen they, they should have. And their brain's full of yeast. If you see these spots, Joanne, you muted me. Sorry, wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> sorry Listen, about that. Listen, I was about to say brilliant, and now it's gone. I apologize. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> a, hey, I would not even... If anybody wants to know why I'm still doing these classes, although I'm retired, it's mostly because of Joanne. If she wouldn't have be willing on her own with me without me paying her, come and do all these things that she's doing for us, I wouldn't be teaching these classes. So, Joanne, I will never complain. You can mute me whenever you want to. <laughs> no. Class, then. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> My mouse just slipped. I was clicking the wrong thing. <laughs> I would never mute you. I love hearing you talk. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm serious about it. People really owe you a big Thank you, because without you, I wouldn't be doing these. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so yeast. What do we do for yeast? You starve it out. You get its natural predators. So starving it out is, you know, if you make bread and you put water in a container and you put yeast, it doesn't do a whole lot. You throw some sugar in there and just whoosh. It foams up and it starts doing its thing. So stay away from anything that's simple sugars, breads, noodles, sugar, things like that. Um, starve it out. Stay away from those things. The natural predator for yeast are good probiotics. Fermented foods is the best way to go. Because the fermented foods, the bacteria, actually eats the yeast, and excretes B vitamins. 
Caprylic acid will suffocate yeast. It engulfs it and seals it off, and it suffocates. These are the ones that I really, 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 really start out with. Making sure your pH is normal is helpful because yeast can go at different pHs and the good bacteria can't, so keeping that balance is important. Make sure you don't get reinfected. Um, yeast can be sexually transmitted. It's not an STD, but if you are working on yeast being controlled in your body and your husband has yeast and you're intimate with him, you can get yeast reintroduced into your body. So these things I that I have squared off here, I suggest for everybody. There is something called yeast fungal. It's not for everyone. These things, the fermented foods and acrylic acid, you can take in pretty decent amounts because it's going to consume the yeast live. When yeast dies, the die-off is extremely, extremely toxic. If you would take a heavy-duty yeast fungal and kill a bunch of yeast off in your body too quickly, you could end up with an autoimmune disease from the toxicity of the die-off. So go slow on that. Try starving it out gradually, the fermented foods, and do the coconut oil. Remember, when you take coconut oil internally, you need to take with the protein. And then mm -hmm. only do yeast fungal if you talk to someone like Joanne or I that have worked with this a lot. I'm sorry, are you going to say something, Joanne? Oh, no, I apologize. Uh, finish your thought and then I'll ask the question. Uh, I'm done thinking. Okay, I keep doing that. I'm just cutting you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> Trying to get back into it after the new year. Um, someone's asking if you can repeat what you said about probiotics and yeast. Yeah, probiotics are good bacteria that's in your intestines, and they're actually bacteria. So they move, they eat, they excrete, and probiotics will eat yeast. I saw it on a live blood analysis, and you will see it usually it doesn't in the intestines, but it can do it in the blood too. But it will hunt out yeast, and it eats it like it's a little critter. We think of bacteria as it's only one cell, but it has a sense of intelligence. Joanne, could you get that lymph one? Do you have that by any chance? It shows how intelligent that one lymph cell is, and it's, and it's like a macrophage, and it goes after a bacteria? Uh, I will look for it. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Okay. But it they actually eat, and they feed on the, the yeast, because you're supposed to have some yeast in your body. You're never going to get 100% out because your body needs some yeast. Well, these bacteria will eat and keep it under control. You know, like if there's too many deer, they'll bring in coyotes or something to kind of keep it balanced. Well, the human body is smarter than the game warden, so they'll do it in a way that's really balanced. You don't end up with a bunch of coyotes like eating your cows. But after they eat, what goes in has to come out, and they excrete or they for lack of a better word, poop out B vitamins. So if anybody ever lacks B vitamins, it's because they do not have enough good bacteria in their intestines. Okay, well, Joanne's doing her thing. Are there any other questions? Uh, that's the only question so far. I'm still looking. Okay. I'll go on. But wait till you see this. It, it just blows your mind away. You know, I believe in God. I've always believed in God. But once you get into this stuff, and once you see and learn all this stuff, there's no denying God. 
It's just not. This stuff is just really cool. And when you see this, it'll blow you away. Okay, so while Joanne's looking for that, if she can find it, and if not, Joanne, that's fine. I just wanted to show them. I think it's kind of cool. Um, type 3 diabetes. They call it type 3 diabetes um, Alzheimer's. That's, you know, sometimes it's because you have too much aluminum in your brain, but sometimes it's because there's too much sugar in your brain. Since most of your sugar, 25% of your sugar goes to the brain, you have to really be careful. Um, most, I know a lot of people that are diabetic. They'll say, yeah, I'm diabetic, but I really want that piece of cake. I'll just take extra insulin. Well, the insulin doesn't eat the sugar. It doesn't wash the sugar out of your body. It either shoves it to the brain, to the muscle, or back to the liver to produce fat. And the, and the, the liver will produce, make fat out of it and store it. So whenever you're giving yourself an extra shot of insulin, either causing yourself to get fat or you are probably damaging your brain. So make sure that um, you know what your sugar level is. I have an AccuCheck, and I check for years. And about a year ago, all of a sudden, my sugar started going up, probably because I'm 62 years old, 60, going to be 63 years old. But my blood sugar went up. I had no uh, none of these symptoms at all. All these symptoms that are here came from what Nature Sunshine says. I didn't have any of them. I had no idea. And all of a sudden, voila, I have it. Did you find it, Joanne? What is sweetie? Here. Is this the one you're thinking? I don't know. I'm, I'm clicking on it. Let's see here. Yep, this is it. Okay, good. Okay. Watch this. This is one of our lymph cells, and this is a bacteria. That bacteria is moving around trying to avoid being eaten, and our lymph cell is chasing it. I just thought your lymphatic system would just kind of bump into it by accident, but it's very calculated. It thinks. Let's do this again for anybody who didn't see it. I think this is just cool. It's not... You can see that bacteria is trying to avoid being eaten. So it has a sense of intelligence. I don't mean it could do calculus or something like that, but there's some sense of survival and intelligence. And that's how it is with bacteria, the good bacteria and um, the yeast. It looked just like that. Although that wasn't, that was our lymphatic system. Thank you very much, Joanne. Does anybody else think that is really cool? Anybody? I do. It's fascinating. I just think that is slick. Okay. Sometimes people will have parasites in the brain. Again, they're usually microscopic. Not always, but most of the time they're microscopic. There is a couple things that you can do. Probably the easiest is to rotate between Teohe and Paracleanse. So you take a Teohe, excuse me, for a whole pack, excuse me, I got hiccups now, a whole packet of Teohe and then all the packets of Paracleanse that's what I get for trying to take a sip while that thing was chasing around. Okay. And you do that three times. And usually that gets rid of, or people tell me that gets rid of parasites. The medical profession basically only checks your stool for parasites. But you can get parasites in your muscles, you can get in your thyroid, you can get in your brain. And then when you have parasites in the brain, and again, 
there are indicators to show you that you might have them in the brain when you do iridology consultation. Um, but if you do a parasite cleanse and you do have indicators that that is a possibility, I would take out glutamine because if not, you can get like really confused and just too tired to think because of the die-off. Because when the parasites are killed, whenever they eat the stuff and it poisons them and they die, they rot. And you got to get rid of that toxins too. So make sure your bowels are moving three times a day. Make sure your liver is working well. And that's what the Teohi is. The Teohi is to make sure that your liver, your kidneys, your bowels, and everything are working at optimum levels. Then you kill off the parasites. Then you clean again. And then you kill off the larva. And you clean again. And then in case something has survived, you do it a third time. And then you clean again. Okay. We talked about brain shrinkage because of lack of fatty acids. You can see this, like, from here to here. We know that the nose belongs right here because your pupil does, is not dead center. It favors the nose a little bit. And from there to there to here to here, this is a little bit shorter. Do you see that? From here to, oops, to here should be exactly the same length as from here to here. And you see that this is not at all. All this, it would be if it went up to here. This is where the brain should be. But the brain is shrinking. Symptoms that you feel when that happens is <clears throat> when you bend down and get up, you might get a little bit, ooh, a little bit lightheaded, a little dizzy. Or if you roll over in bed or something like that, like doctors call it vertigo, but there's different levels of it. Um, and that happens when you're lacking fatty acids because your brain could slush around a little bit in there. You also might get forgetful. Like, what did I come in the kitchen for? That kind of a thing. Or what was I doing? Or did I do that? Did I mail that? I know I was going to. Did I mail that? Those kind of things. It can also be names. I don't know if I'm ever going to have a problem. I can't do the names because I was never good at names. I suck at names. When my my kids were little, we were watching a program on dementia and Alzheimer's, and my daughter turns around, 11 years old, tears streaming down her face. I said, honey, what's the matter? She says, how do we know if you get Alzheimer's? You do that stuff now. And she's right. I did. I was just never very good at that kind of remembering people's names. But if you were good at it and you start catching yourself like, I know that actor is good as my own name, and you can't think of it, or it takes a little while to think of it, then I would look in the eye and I would nourish the brain, a lot of fatty acids. You can't take huge amount of fatty acids because your liver can only, produce, can only um, accommodate so much and digest so much, and whatever isn't digested with the bile, the bile salts, then it can go to the liver and it can make you have a fatty liver. So if you have a gallbladder, make sure you keep it optimum health. Make sure you keep your liver at optimum health. Eat a protein with it because it's a protein that tells the liver, I mean the gallbladder, to release the bowel salts to emulsify the fats. This is my favorite right here. The only thing that you have to watch with super omega-3 oil is it slightly thins the blood. And like I said, um, Lawrence Smith said there's only 10 parts per billion impurity. That's huge. I don't know of any product anywhere else in the world that does that. Creole oil, I don't like creole oil as well. Creole oil um, is made of these ugly looking creatures and they're it's more like if you're ego-friendly because these, like, multiply like rabbits, you know, and it doesn't take as long. And the chances of us getting rid of all the krill in the world is very low. 
but since super omega-3 oil thins the blood, you can't take this if you're in Coumadin or any kind of blood thinner, um, if you're hemophiliac, so if I get, you can't take this. It's dangerous for you. So what Nature Sunshine did is they put clear oil and they added vitamin K. So the people who are on a blood thinner, or is what they call a bleeder, um, they would have something that they could take as well. Could you repeat it's a vitamin K plus what for the krill oil? Well, they had the krill oil and they added vitamin K to it. Vitamin K helps you clot. So if you're in any kind of anticoagulant, you need to make sure that you can still clot because if you get cut really easy, you bleed, you know. If I take more than six super omega-3 oil a day, I bruise very easily. But they didn't add the vitamin K to super omega? No, because most people have blood that's too thick. You know, there's a lot of people that are on blood thinners. And if someone's on Coumadin, I will tell them, you know what, let's ask your doctor to do this. If you want to get on super omega-3 oil instead of the Coumadin or whatever medicine they're on and tell them that as you add a little bit of super omega-3 oil, if they can keep testing your blood so they can decrease the medication. And then we get them that they don't need the blood thinner anymore. They can just do the super omega-3 oil. But there's many more people that have too thick a blood than too thin a blood. So they wanted to have it either way. If your blood is normal or too thick, I would take the super omega-3 oil. If your blood is too thin, then I would do the krill oil. Any other questions? And that's it. Oh, how would someone know if it's too thick? Well, if you go to the doctor, they can give you a blood test, and I usually tell you. Even the tech, you know, would tell you. Whenever they would take take my blood, it would clot before they would even fill up one of those little tubey thingies. And um, or if you get cut, do you bleed, or does it like just beat up a little bit and it doesn't bleed very much? And you think you should bleed a little more than, you know, normal. Now that I take my blood sugar all the time, um, there's times whenever I have to squish my thumb like crazy to get the blood to come to the surface, and I know it's too thick. It doesn't happen very often because I take, not late me anyhow because I've been taking super omega-3 oil. Or if I do it and it like squirts out like I hit an artery, that means it's a little too thin. i got to back off a little bit. Other than, like, punching yourself, I really don't know how else you would know. That's a good question. Do you know, Joanne? I have no idea, as you said, other than from the doctor. Yeah. And for people that don't go to the doctors, like me, I've been to the doctor one time in 30 years. I do my own, but there's a place called Any Test Anytime in this area. That you go and you don't have to have the doctor's script. You can just say, I want to see if my blood's too thick. And they go, nope, it's not, or yeah, it is, you know, and they can give you the, the results to you. If your blood's too thick, you're more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. Okay, any other questions? Okay. 
the brain needs vitamins and minerals. The minerals it needs, number one, is magnesium. And we already talked about this. Craving chocolate or coffee, heart palpitations or fluttering, and your butt cool to the touch. Zinc is another thing. Zinc is um, a micronutrient, a trace, I'm sorry, a trace mineral. So you don't need a whole lot. A little dab will do you. The symptoms are lacking a sense of smell, stinking, thinking, foot odor, the little white dots on your on your nails. Some people say, no, that's because I told a lie. No, it's not because you told a lie. It's because you're lacking things. Or rough skin in the back of the upper arms. These are things that show a zinc deficiency. There's a saying, a husband, if you can't think, take zinc. If your feet stink, take zinc. There's something about smelling, too, to take zinc. But you only take a little bit. Usually what I suggest, rather than taking zinc, is for people to eat pumpkin seeds, because there's zinc in pumpkin seeds. The brain and nervous system is very dependent upon B complex. Um, if you have enough fermented foods, your body will produce its own B vitamins. The average person, if they ate well, should not need B vitamins. If you have these symptoms, however, sensitivity to light, a hard time falling to sleep, or if you don't dream every night, you could be lacking B vitamins. Sometimes, too, you get cracks around the corners of your mouth, and you might jiggle your leg or tap your pencil or something like that. There's, There's some um, question. I'm sorry. That's okay. There's, on the last slide, would constipation be a magnesium deficiency? Absolutely. Good job. Very, very good job. Yes. And someone said, my veins collapse whenever I try to get my blood drawn, and my veins don't seem to produce a lot of blood. Is this the result of having thick blood? No, usually that's because you have a lack of rutin, which is a mineral that, I mean, which is a vitamin that um, is found in vitamin C and bioflavonoids, and that keeps the permeability of your the integrity or the strength of your blood vessels. So if you have varicose veins or spider veins, or if your veins collapse, a lot of times that means you're lacking vitamin C. The rutin is found in bell peppers, paprika, um, any kind of citrus fruit if you eat the white. You know, like some people spend like the whole day peeling off every little piece of white. Well, the white has a lot of good in it. Any other questions? No, that's it. Okie dokie. Then there's something um, called focus attention. This is basically given to children um, or adults too. If you find out that you have a hard time studying, reading, staying focused, that you can add. It nourishes the brain as well. Usually if you work on your myelin and take good nutrition, you don't need that as much, but I want to put that in here. This is the um, Brain Protects is what Dr. Amen was so impressed with this whenever he taught. And um, it has super seen in it. I don't know what else to say about it, but it's really good. For anyone to take. And we talked about the magnesium already. And I think this came from Joanne. Joanne, you told me this, right? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, do you want to tell us about it? Uh, sure. Uh, Stephen Horn, in his book, he talked about HSNW. It has um, ingredients such as silica, which are really good in building the nervous system. So, of course, that's the key to brain health. Okay. And other symptoms of a lack of silica is wussy uh, fingernails. Your fingernails should be like tight, you know, um, strong, and your hair should be strong. If it breaks off easily, that could be a lack of silica. Thank you. I didn't even know that. Joanne's the one that brought that to my attention. There's and I love couple. Stephen Horn. Huh? Yeah, me too. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, yeah, I love him too. Um, Denise says, I'm hanging on to your every word. This webinar is fantastic. Thank you both. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for saying so. I, I love this stuff. I am so addicted to this stuff. You have no idea. That's why I retired and I'm still doing the same thing. I just don't get paid for it anymore. But I love it because I can't give it up. Okay, frankincense. Oh, wait, sorry, there's two more. Uh, okay. Cherie was saying that she gets good results with nature's sunshine. I guess you mean vitamin C, a sorbate powder, or there's varagon for varicose uh, spider veins. And right. So, so you said the Kimberly is the lady that her veins collapse, right? Yes. Hey, Kimberly, do you have any varicose veins or any spider veins? No. Oh. Then I'm not sure. Could it be dehydration then? It could be. Do you drink half of your body weight in ounces of water? Because that will also thicken the blood. No, but I try. Yeah, but, you know, your your veins don't necessarily collapse when your blood's too thick. They just know blood comes out. You know what I mean? Uh, Cherie was saying especially dehydration on the day of taking the blood. Yeah, I know, which is kind of crazy because they tell you not to eat or drink anything. You know, you have to fast or whatever. They should tell you that water doesn't include that fast. I actually did have a nurse because I have, well, I haven't taken my blood in a long time, but when I did very rolly veins, and a nurse did say, drink some water at least half an hour before for that reason. Oh. Ah. Yeah, my veins roll too, but rolling veins are different than collapsing veins. Mm. Collapsing veins means the integrity of the tissue that makes up the blood vessel is weak. And that's usually a rooting problem for vitamin C. So the only thing I could do is, and as much as we know about natural health now, some of it we just have to do by trial and error. I hate to say it. But next time you go, I would probably... Um, Take some vitamin C for a while first. So there's a question, what about rolling veins? Rolling veins are usually your veins are tough. So they're strong. And whenever you try to put the needle in, it moves rather than punctures through. That just means you're a badass. No, I don't. It means that your, your veins are, are very strong. It's not a bad thing. Because quite frankly, you're not supposed to be sticking holes in your veins. So there's nothing wrong with you when that happens. You know what I'm saying? Good point. And It's asking... a pain in the butt when you get your blood tested because I have rolling veins too and I usually get stuck 10 times before they can get enough blood out of me. Me but, too. Um, but it's nothing wrong with you because that's what the veins are meant for. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, Sheree was asking Kimberly if she tests her pH. Do 
Yeah, I'm still thinking it's probably vitamin C with bioflavonoids and root. She said not lately, but she runs a little acidic, so she was saying she may not be absorbing the vitamin C. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I see where you're going at. Yep. I agree, Sheree. And for people that don't know, Sheree is a naturopath from Austra uh, New Zealand, Australia. Like she goes, she lives, she's born in New, you were born in New Zealand, right? And you live in Australia now? <laughs> she said, yes, she's a Kiwi. Come visit. <laughs> Okay, so she knows what she's talking about. She's not like, you know, somebody's just smoking pot and say, hey, let's see what I can watch tonight. She really knows her stuff. Okay. And there's oh, one more question uh, back there. Uh, Kimberly was wondering if she takes HSNW, would it grow hair in places where you don't want it, like the chin <laughs> or lip? <laughs> it should not. It should not, no. Whenever you have hair grown on your chin, that's usually an ovary problem. If you're a woman and it grows around the nipples, it's usually an adrenal problem. Um, like nose grown out, hair grown on your nose, your ears, that's not supposed to happen. So no, it's just it just make your hair, and it doesn't even necessarily make your hair thicker. As, I mean, like more of it coming in, as much as it doesn't break very easy. So I had a friend who said. Man, I hate it when I'm 40 years old, my hair doesn't grow. I said, my hair grows like crazy, and I'm 62. And she says, no, it just grows one length. It doesn't get any longer. Well, it's breaking off, and she had slit ends everywhere. I don't have much hair because the doctors killed my thyroid. But what hair I have doesn't break off. My hair can grow way down to almost touching my butt. I cut it up to my shoulders, and it grows down again because it doesn't break off. That's what silica does. Silica is kind of like the cement of the body or the super glue that keeps things together. So no, it's not gonna you're not gonna end up with like hair coming down your nose or something. And I did say hair on the chin is ovaries, right? I'm pretty sure yes. Yes, you did. Okay. I'm gonna make sure then Around your nipples is adrenals. Okay, any other questions? Uh, that's it. Okay, on to frankincense. Frankincense, I'm sure you know, is one of the three things that was given to the Christ child because of all the health benefits of the frankincense. Plus they did it from different rituals and stuff like that. But it soothes the nervous system and the brain. It helps you to be centered and comforted. And it, it, it lifts the moods a little bit. It's definitely been used for meditation and spirituality and the rituals, like I said. But this is the biggest part of why I suggest you do it. It helps nutrients cross the blood-brain barrier. To protect you, the body has made it so that every little thing that you are exposed to doesn't get into the brain. Because the brain doesn't like anything that shouldn't be there in that area. Well, if you have frankincense in a diffuser, or you can rub it around your neck or whatever, it helps nutrients get into the brain. There's, okay. okay. There's a question. Is mm -hmm. there anything anything that can be done to eliminate the hair around the nipples or the chin? Um, the chin, make sure you break up break up the um cyst on your ovaries. So if it's the right ovary, I use belladonna. If it's the left ovary, I use lachesis. If you've gone through menopause and it develops, then it could you might have to work with the adrenals too, because after we go through menopause, our ovaries don't produce estrogen and progesterone anymore. 
it is solely on the the adrenal job. So sometimes you have to work with that. Around the nipple, work with the adrenals. Stay away from stress. The more stress, the more likely you are to have hair around your nipple. And it doesn't hurt you, you know, but it does, and it does indicate that your adrenals are a little bit weak. So I would um, probably take some pancreatic acid, some chromium. My favorite source of chromium is red clover. Um, punch whenever you have to. Take our class on stressed out. You'll learn a lot about adrenals there. Any other questions? No, nope, that's it. Okay. Alrighty. So, if you don't use it, you lose it. Aerobics for the brain. Make sure you get enough sleep. There's a lot of people who pride themselves and say, oh, I only need two, three hours of sleep a night. No, you don't. The human body needs more than that. Your brain needs more than that. You need to sleep for seven or eight hours, and you need to get into the dream state at least once, preferably three times during the night. Typically, you only remember the last dream you had. But it's important to sleep the whole night through and to dream every night. It's good for the brain. It's like turning your computer off at night and rebooting the next day. That's what it does to the brain. You need to hydrate. We talked about Gotacola and Ginkgo being basal dilators and nourishing the brain. Capsicum, like cayenne pepper, uh, red pepper, but capsicum is like cayenne pepper on steroids. It's really hot. Um, it will help push the energy and the circulation from the in, the middle and the liver to the extremities. So if you always have cold hands or cold feet, if you take capsicum, it will keep your hands and your feet warm. The only thing is, if you have a weak liver, you shouldn't take capsicum because when the liver is weak, it will take circulation from the extremity to itself to heal. So before you take capsicum, contact me. We'll talk it over and see if you have liver symptoms. Okay, eating breakfast in the morning is very important. Drawing the number eight, I'll show you that in a minute. Cross-crawling is very important whenever you have children or grandchildren that you allow them to crawl because whenever you do, you engage both hemispheres of the brain because whenever you're right arm goes out, your left leg goes out. And when your left leg, the left arm goes out, the right leg goes out. And it's called repattering the brain. And it helps use both hemispheres and makes the brain healthier. Okay, we did all that other stuff. Okay, this there's is the a, eight. There's a question. <laughs> did Nature Sunshine stop selling red clover? Not in the capsule or the liquid form, just in the bulk. There's not enough people are buying it. They didn't put it in tea bags. And I don't know if a lot of people know that you can get these things you can use instead of tea bags. If you take our herbology class, we cover all the different ways you can use loose teas. But yeah, people just didn't want to be fussing with it. Which is a piss because it's a lot cheaper whenever it was just bulk. A lot cheaper. Actually, it seems like they did stop selling the capsules, too. <gasps> they did? Well, they didn't ask me. <laughs> they did, really? Do they have the liquid? No. Both things, I think, have been discontinued. Sounds like we might have to get on a campaign. Yeah, nope, no longer available. All right. Well, I didn't know that. I don't sell the herbs anymore, really. I mean, I just tell people that order directly or I send somebody like to Joanne. So if any of this stuff tonight, if you want any of it, uh, Joanne sells it at wholesale price, which you're not going to get any better than that, you know. But 
I didn't know that. We're, we're, we need to get that back. So we'll start a campaign one of these days. Remind me, Joanne. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay, go ahead. Oh, and someone's asking if you can repeat why not to take capsicum when your liver is weak. The liver, the only time the liver pulls circulation from the extremities to itself is if it is desperately trying to heal. Well, you don't want to take anything that's going to keep the liver from healing because the liver is, next to the brain, the liver is the next most important part of your body. It has at least 561 functions. Some health books say 2,000 different functions. So you don't want to impair its healing. And that's what it does. It basically says we're ignoring you, liver, and we're going to put the circulation out to the extremities. Does that make sense? But if your liver's fine, then you can take it. If you're not sure, contact me or Joanne, and we can kind of help you know whether or not um, your liver is going to be able to handle it. Any other questions? That is it. Okay. So this is what it's, this is up here, what it says about drawing the number eight. This is not as hard, I mean, it's not as easy as a look. I would make a big number eight on a piece of paper, just draw an eight on a piece of paper. Then you take your right hand and you follow the eight and you keep doing it. I'm trying to say exact, I'm not doing it. It's harder to do with miles. Go faster and faster and faster until You'd be surprised how hard that is to do with mouse. Anyhow, you keep doing it until you go really, really fast. Then you take your left hand and you do the same thing. Really, until you get really, really, really fast. Usually it takes longer for your non-dominant hand for you to be able to go really fast. Then you do them both at the same time. You put your right finger here, you put your left finger here, and you kind of get them that they don't run into each other, but you're drawing an eight at the same time with both hands. This isn't too hard. This is a little bit harder because you're not using your dominant hand. This one, I almost break my fingers. I mean, you know, they're like tangling up and everything else. This is a lot harder, at least for me, maybe because my brain isn't connected right or something. I don't know, but you'd be surprised how difficult it is. Not to go slow, but if you're going really fast, you end up both of the fingers going in the same direction when they're supposed to be going in opposite direction. You see, this one you're going up like this. This one you're going down like this. That's also really good that, that children and your grandchildren do because it helps stimulate their learning immensely. Okay, capsicum, if you, your um, liver's okay, one capsicum a day is a good idea. Uh, if you take too much capsicum, if you have hemorrhoids, they'll get burned off because it is hot coming out. And it can cause some digestive disturbances. If you could gradually do it, you know, um, you can usually go up. I can usually take maybe eight a day, and it doesn't bother me at all. But I wouldn't start out with that. Then there's something called um, life weight patches, and it's called glutathione. Glutathione is produced by the body, and it is um, a man master antioxidant. It helps the body cleanse, it helps the liver cleanse, it helps the methylation cycle, it helps the body heal, and it helps the brain heal. Um, here are some studies that show about glutathione. I have more than this. I just didn't put it all on here. 
the Booth Iron Patch. You just put on. I leave mine on for a week, and then I change it. Reposition it and change it. But the reason why it's called Why Age is because they're saying you should, you don't have to age. Your brain, this helps keep you alert and cognitive much longer than if you did not take it. And there's all kinds of studies that show that. Okay, so I'm going to do this first, and then we'll do that. There's a way to test whether or not you could have a tendency towards Alzheimer's. There's a study that they did that showed that people who could smell peanut butter, not just anything, but peanut butter for some reason, out of both nostrils evenly, are less likely to get Alzheimer's than people who can smell out of one um, nostril than the other. So if you take the peanut butter and you kind of put your finger over your one nostril, I guess, and you open up the peanut butter jar and you start bringing it close to you and let's say you're a foot from you and you can smell the peanut butter. Then you put the lid back on and you wait a while until the peanut butter smell leaves. And then you clog up the other nostril and you do it and see how it close. If it is both a foot away from you, that's good. If it if you need six inches close to you, it's not as good. But if they're both the same, you're less likely to get Alzheimer's. My grandkids are never getting Alzheimer's because whenever I read this, this study that they did, I I was doing it. I helped homeschool my grandkids, and they were over there. And I opened the the thing, and I had it probably about six inches to my nose before I could smell the peanut butter. And my grandkids were like. The one was maybe 15 feet from me. They're saying, who's eating peanut butter? They smelled it right away. Okay. And then a part of use it or lose it, there are things that, um, studies about it, and there's actually places where you can get brain games. I use the AARP one because it's free and I'm cheap. But they have games that for people to use to keep their minds working. Remember, if you don't use it, they die after a week. My friend had, uh, her husband had Alzheimer's. And he went to this big specialist somewhere in Chicago. She took him the whole way out to Chicago. And he gave him like a handheld thing, almost like a Game Boy. That he had to do so much time every day. And she saw an improvement in him. Okie dokie. So, do any of these guys have any questions? Mm, no questions. Okay. Well, here's Joanne's name and her phone number, her email, and she has a great Facebook group. So I noticed you haven't been posting as often. Have you? Yep. I go for the holidays, every, really? Yep, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Oh, maybe I just missed it. Well, I had like 10,000... Happy birthday and happy new year, so maybe it just didn't pop up in mine. Okay. But anyhow, um, she has all kind of stuff on her thing. And she's kind enough that if you do want to buy something, she will show you how you can get it cheaper. I mean, she can get the glutathione patches cheaper than I can get them. And I'm her, her manager. But it's because she buys so many. She can get them cheaper than I can get them for myself. Um, <clears throat> and then if you have any questions, I'm here. I am semi-retired. But I can't give this stuff up. I love it too much. So if you have any questions about your own health, here I am. If you want to 
learn how to do this yourself. I teach the Jensonian Iridology online. I do these classes online, and they're all free. But I do have some um, thumb drives where you can take natural health professionals or IPA classes. And then if you have questions, you contact me. We go one-on-one. -on -one. I don't teach in big classes anymore. But I still teach it. All right. So does anybody have any? Oh, somebody sent me this. Sniffing rosemary helps increase your memory. All righty. So no questions. What's our next class, Joanne? Our next class is fertility and conception. Enough to scary, isn't it? <laughs> Just kidding. So I hope you come to our classes again, and you all take care. And since this is the first class of the year, I know it's a little bit late, but Happy New Year's. And Joanne, thank you so much, so, so much for all that you do for us. You are welcome. Cherie says thanks, and she's off to sniff rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All righty. Well, you all take care. Good night, everyone.